I think we should get started. First of all, wow. Thank you all, all for coming out. Um, am I holding this okay, Paul? Okay, and can you all hear me in the back? Because I know this doesn't amplify. Okay, well, anyway, what a lovely town you have, and thank you all so much for um, coming out tonight, and thank you to the Whitman Public Library for um, hosting us, and we're so happy to be in the birthplace of the chocolate chip cookie. You know, we write about landmarks, and that's really something that should be celebrated for sure. And um, just to tell you briefly, David and I are freelance travel and food writers, and we've written a number of traditional guidebooks to New England, including the top 10 and eyewitness guidebooks from um, Dorling Kindersley in Great Britain. So as, as you can imagine, we've put a lot of miles on our car driving throughout New England for, for years now. And we've always been really kind of surprised and often charmed by the fascinating variety of places, hi, that um, have the designation as National Historic Landmarks. So this book, Historic New England is really um, our kind of more personal look at New England and New Englanders. And it's our choice of 100 of these landmarks. And several people, we've done a couple of these talks now, and several people have told us they're going to use the book um, to plan some summer day trips, which is, I think, a great idea. It really suits itself to that. And if you're really ambitious, one woman told us at our last presentation that she's going to use use it as her New England bucket list. So just to give you a little idea of what we're going to do tonight, um, we're going to start by reading, I promise, an abbreviated version of the introduction to the book because it, it will give you a bit of a, an idea of our thinking when we selected the landmarks and a little bit of an idea of what's contained in the book. But we took out all the words that are hard to pronounce and just shrunk it up a little so it won't take um, too much time. And then David and I each picked um, one favorite landmark in each of the six New England states. And so we'll tell you about those briefly. It'll leave time for questions, I hope. Everyone's had such interesting questions when we've been doing these talks. And then we do have books if anyone's interested. So I'm going to start and then turn it over to David for the introduction. We're sticking here with the picture of the book cover to fill all the sorts of grain, <laughs> grain <laughs> for the first portion, and then we'll move on. Things. Things. We've got some better pictures. So you, the ones who came early saw the drama when we all figured out how to make this work, but we've got it down now. So within these pages, you'll find three submarines, a whaling ship, four wind jammers, a colonial jail, an operating room, a bird sanctuary, three, three Shaker villages, a boat building workshop, two lighthouses, a stopover on the Underground Railroad, three carousels, and a terrific public beach. And they are all National Historic Landmarks. We were initially surprised to discover that not all historic landmarks are antique homes of founding fathers or wealthy merchants. Now, some of them are, and they're often really fascinating places. But the sites in the six New England states are surprisingly diverse, which got us thinking about what makes a national historic landmark. Originally, a landmark was just that, a mark in the landscape to tell us where we were and how to get wherever we were going. The old English word meant a marker for the boundaries of a state, a kingdom, or a community. By 1859, the term was being used figuratively for a place or event that marked a turning point in history. And it's that figurative sense that is employed by the National Historic Landmarks Program. Welcome. There are a couple seats right up front. <laughs> um, the places selected for the designation still serve a similar purpose as those ancient boundary stones or blazes on a tree. They mark our place in the cultural landscape and provide guidance about where we all might be headed. Now, New England has a concentration of national historic landmarks greater than anywhere else in the country except, guess, New York and California. Um, so they reveal a great deal about our regional identity, both what we celebrate and what we feel defines us. 
Now, we recognize that much of the country feels that we New Englanders have a puffed up sense of ourselves, but we have every right to be proud of our many national firsts, and that includes the first public arboretum, municipal public library, enclosed shopping center, independent law school, scientific weather observatory, bird sanctuary, and even the first nuclear-powered submarine. And some of our national historic landmarks show how our region grew from the simple salt box of the 1680, uh, 1686 Jethro Coffin House. It's the oldest house on Nantucket. And if you visit, it's really interesting. There's a very good Romeo and Juliet sort of backstory there. And then to the jewel box of Philip Johnson's glass house, which is a gleaming example of modern architecture. And likewise, the landmarks trace our industrial history from Slater Mill in Rhode Island to the thundering mills, locks, and canals of Lowell to the perfectly preserved 19th century mill village of Harrisville, New Hampshire. New England values also shape the character of our national leaders. So our landmarks include the birthplaces of four presidents, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and John Fitzgerald Kennedy in Massachusetts, and Calvin Coolidge in Vermont, as well as the childhood home of another one, Franklin Pierce in New Hampshire. We also, as New Englanders, held very strong to the idea of human freedom. So among the landmarks, the Prudence Crandall House in Connecticut demonstrates the beginning of the civil rights struggle in education, while the African Meeting House in Boston was a cradle of the civil rights movement in the years before the Civil War. Rokeby Farm in northern Vermont is one of the best authenticated stops on the Underground Railroad that carried the fugitives to freedom. At the same time, the New England landscape inspired writers and thinkers and artists. Uh, Henry David Thoreau went to the woods at landmark Walden Pond. Many of the best American Impressionists painted along the Connecticut coast during summers at the Florence Griswold House, uh, while Winslow Homer drew his strength from the sea and the rocky coast of Maine at his studio on Prout's Neck, south of Portland. Poet Robert Frost found his voice building stone walls and watching the shift of seasons in Derry, New Hampshire. Uh, sculptors Daniel Chester French and Augustus St. Gaudens built summer studios in western Massachusetts and along the Connecticut River in New Hampshire. And modern dance pioneer created Jacob's, uh, Ted Sean created Jacob's Pillow at the top of a mountain in the Berkshires. But you know what? We also know how to have fun. Uh, among our treasured landmarks are historic carousels in Watch Hill and Riverside, Rhode Island, and Oaks, Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard, uh, Revere Beach, First public beach in America. It's right on the subway line from Boston. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, our golden age of mountain recreation lives on at the Mount Washington Hotel. Uh, and the Newport Casino marks the introduction of lawn tennis to the United States. And, you know, our national preoccupation with football gets its due at the Yale Bowl in the New Haven. So there are more than 2,500 National Historic Landmarks which in the words of the National Park Service, possess exceptional value or quality in illustrating or interpreting the his heritage of the United States. Now, by our count, there are about 400 of them in New England. And one of our greatest regrets was that we couldn't include them all. Uh, we eliminated those that are inaccessible or nearly so to the public. Um, counts a nice church over in Hingham. Uh, those where there isn't a whole lot to see and those that lie on Boston's Freedom Trail or within the Minuteman National Historic Park because, frankly, they're so well documented elsewhere. Everybody knows. But we still had to make some hard decisions to narrow the list. And ultimately, the choices are ours, and we apologize to the many worthy sites we had to leave out. Uh, we hope that once you've exhausted our list, though, you'll make your own and keep discovering the places and the people uh, that have defined New England. So now we can get some more. We can move on to some more slides. Yeah, get some pictures. So we're going to start in Massachusetts, and I'm going to start. Some of you have already recognized this when we were having our little 
check rehearsal. <laughs> this is um, the mount in Lenox, Massachusetts. Um, it was built in 1902 for Edith Wharton, and you probably know her best as a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist. Um, but I really do have to tell you, can you hear me? Can we sh shut the lights off? Let's see why not. As long as we can read. Um. <laughs> yeah. I think we can make do. Okay. So I have to tell you, if she were alive today, um, she would be an HGTV star. Maybe we need one up here. <laughs> hmm. Can you turn the one on in the little alcove? Is there a light out there? Oh, good idea. Looks like it. Is, no, nope. the garbage. <laughs> 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 no, it's just an idea. Uh, Does anybody know where they are? Let me go. Is this a one? No. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, we've got, we think we've got a solution here. These on put down the blind. I think it'll still show you. Let's see. Mm -hmm. We can use our flashlight. Mm -hmm. have one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Is that better? A little better, I hope. <laughs> better yeah. sorry <laughs> okay well I'm gonna if you don't mind I'll keep going here so this is the mount in Lenox Massachusetts built in 1902 for Edith Wharton and as I said you all probably know her as the you know a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist but if she were alive today the woman would be an HG TV star she was actually born Edith Newbold Jones, and it's widely believed, this is true, that the um, phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, was coined to refer, refer to her wealthy socialite family in New York. And her first book um, was published in 1897, and it was called The Decoration of Houses. And she wrote it with architect Ogden Codman, Jr., Oh no, now that's in his eyes. <laughs> that's not working either, yeah. Whoa. How's that? Is that is that right with you guys here in the front? Okay. So her co author was Ogden Codman Junior. And then obviously it went well because she collaborated with him again when she decided to put her ideas into practice by building this country estate in the Berkshires. And she um, basically was inspired by all, by all her trips that wealthy people took to Europe. And it's a marvelous mix of an English country estate with a French style courtyard and Italianate gardens. But she knew what she was doing. It really does come together um, really quite marv marvelously. And as was the tradition of the super rich at the time, Edith and her husband, Teddy Wharton, only um, lived here from May until October. And they actually only used the house for a decade. Um, when their marriage broke up, Edith sold it. She was the one with the money. And um, she moved permanently to France. But there are really good guided tours given of the property. And they give a sense of how thoroughly she enjoyed the house during the, those 10 years. And I especially like a good Edith's bedroom, which, by the way, she did not share with Teddy. Um, and the windows look out at the, uh, the, at the gardens where some of her beloved dogs were buried. And she rode in bed every morning from sunrise until 11 a.m. And during the time that she was in the house, she completed the novels The House of Mirth and Ethan Frome. Um, and even with such a big house, Edith preferred small gatherings to big parties, and she insisted on a round table in the dining room to, um, so the conversation could flow more easily. And Henry James was one of her frequent visitors, and I always wish that could have been a fly on the wall um, during their dinner parties. Okay, we'll switch. Actually, I'm just going to turn this on. Okay. Now for something completely different, the polar opposite. You guys 
This isn't very far from here, actually. This is the Blue Hill Meteorological Observatory in Milton. Um, now, ever since I was a kid, I've had this peculiar habit of going outside early in the morning uh, to take a look at the sky and kind of sniff the wind. And I call it my ambiance check, you know, as if calling it something French made it more important. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays, I confess, I open up my phone, I tap the Weather Underground app, <laughs> and uh, get surprisingly nuanced predictions of temperature, precipitation, and wind speed. Bob Dylan used to sing that you don't need a weatherman to tell which way the wind blows, but my newfound reliance on Weather Underground kind of belies that. Um, the magic behind that app goes all the way back to this spot in the hills of Hop, south of Boston. Since 1885, the Blue Hill Observatory has been collecting uh, meteorological data that becomes the raw materials for figuring out the weather. These are all, in the old days, handwritten logs every single day. I suppose we could have opened the kitchen, the uh, yeah, refrigerator door. No, they're just, they're not, it's lights, I think they're just fans. One of them is, yeah, one that's Yeah. Anyway, the, 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 the observatory is still an active site, um, and it has this unbroken log of daily weather conditions that goes back to February 1st, 1885. And for what it's worth, the highest temperature ever recorded at the site 101 degrees Fahrenheit was noted in August 1949, for those of you who might remember it, in August 1975. Um, the coldest, which was minus 21 degrees Fahrenheit, was recorded in February 1934. Um, they offer tours on weekends, and the visitors get to see some of the marvelous Victorian recording apparatus, which is invariably made of brass, wood, and glass. Uh, and it's tucked onto shelves next to the printers and the computers and all the high-tech gear that churns out modern weather charts. Uh, you can either drive up to the parking lot at the top or you can park down below and hike up through the woods. It's a very nice walk, actually. Uh, not too steep. But after visiting, I always feel justified in my morning routine because the observers at Blue Hill climb out on the roof of their tower three times a day to make note of cloud types, optical phenomena like rainbows or sun dogs, and to record the visibility, which on this particular day was about six feet. Um, <laughs> now that's what I call an ambiance check. Okay. So you know what, I realize. You stand over closer. here. <laughs> to, I mean, no, see, this is good as long as there's a brighter slide. So we are moving on to Rhode Island and this is the um, Crescent Park Loof Carousel in Riverside, which is a summer vis a village of East Providence. And it was designed by one of the com uh, country's premier carousel makers, Charles I.G. Loof, in um, 1895. And then it was fully refurbished about a decade later when he moved his entire operation from Brooklyn um, to Riverside. And actually, while in, in Brooklyn, that's when he really started to make his name by creating three <coughs> carousels for Coney Island. So even though his operations ended up in Riverside, Rhode Island, um, it is still known as the Coney Island style. But he wanted, Loof wanted this carousel at Crescent Park to be a showstopper. And it features um, 66 figures, which include 61 horses, one camel um, and four chariots. And his animals were known for their really flamboyant decoration. They've got inset glass jewels and they have a lot of um, gold and silver leaf. And what's amazing is on that huge carousel, no two animals are alike. Um, basically, um, carousel customers could come, walk around, and then select what they wanted for their own carousel. So this wonderful, joyful ride of summer was really a great salesman's sample. 
Now this is one of three carousels in the book, and there are a lot of other less historic carousels still operating here in New England, but it's a sad fact that um, about a century ago, there were more than 4,000 carousels in the United States, and only a fraction of them um, remain today. Now, Loof's descendants kept this one operating until 1977, when the park itself closed. <coughs> and now, as is the case with so many landmarks, it was local fans who stepped in and saved it. It looked like it was going to be auctioned off piece by piece to, you know, carousel animal um, collectors. But the carousel in the building that it sits in, this beautiful building with all these glass windows, it's called the Hippodrome. But it's now, they're now owned by the city of East Providence, and it's been fully restored. And even the original Germ German um, band organ still plays. And I have to tell you, there's also a very nice seasonal um, snack bar in the park. So if you want to go down, you can really make a nice afternoon of it. And the truth is, when you see kids just running up to the building, they're so full of joy, and then they climb on the horses, and they reach out as far as they can to grab the brass ring. And you can just tell that all the preservation efforts were worthwhile. Another part of Rhode Island, this is the Gilbert Stewart House, or the birthplace. Now, I've always thought of Gilbert Stewart I know he's an artist, but I always thought of him as the money man. Uh, his near contemporary was John Singleton Copley, arguably the more adept painter, who created really beautiful portraits with great psychological detail. That wasn't Stuart's style. He painted kind of stiff figures, and he did it intentionally, um, because these were the august members of society in his time. And they kind of liked it to be painted as if they were Roman senators or emperors or gods, except wearing their what passed for modern dress in those days, along with their periwigs, of course. Um, over the years, he did very well. I mean, he painted over a thousand portraits. But for a man who would become the painter of New England society, Stuart had pretty humble beginnings. He was born upstairs here above a snuff mill. Uh, America's first snuff mill, for what it's worth. Uh, the restoration of the building is largely a recreation of colonial life. And you know, if you've ever been to any colonial life place, you know the drill. You see the fireplace, you see the bed, you twist. You know, you hear the story about bed bugs and twisting. You know, twisting the ropes to tighten the mattress. Um, but there are some little details, like this one. This is the birth of. Uh, where he was in fact born. Now, I don't know if that's the real bed or not, but uh, and above the bed hangs a reproduction of his very first painting that he made when I believe he was 13 years old, uh, which is pretty impressive. And throughout the rest of the house there are actually a number of reproductions of his works uh, hanging, and there's an attached museum that's all modern and it has some real Gilbert, Gilbert Stewart's, as well as some paintings by his very talented daughter, Jane. Now, I'll tell you why I think of Stewart as the money man. Because he painted the unfinished portrait of George Washington that art historians call the Athenaeum portrait, because for many years it belonged to the Boston Athenaeum. Uh, Stewart painted it near the end of Washington's life, late in 1796, early 1797, and that kind of explains why the president looks old and weary. Stuart kept this unfinished portrait for himself and gave a different one to Washington. And over the years, he produced at least 130 copies of his own canvas. In fact, he referred to the image as my $100 bill, because that's what he charged. Now, given that he died in 1828, that was a lot of money in those days. He had no idea of knowing, though, that 101 years later, the US Treasury would adopt his Washington portrait for the $1 bill. Millions and millions and millions of $1 bills. So we're moving on to Connecticut now. And this is the um, glass house in New Canaan. Now, I have to admit 
that I once thought that National Historic Landmarks would have to be you know, at least 100 years old, 150 years old, if not as old as the Gilbert Stewart House. Um, but traveling around New England really set me straight about that. And in fact, this book contains two um, icons of mid 20th century um, architecture. And as I said, this is the Glass House in New Canaan, Connecticut. And it was um, designed by Philip Johnson, who was really one of the architects in the forefront of modern design. Um, he completed it in 1949, and he really helped put what was a very traditional community on the path to becoming um, a modernist uh, enclave. Um, Johnson was just one of five Harvard-trained architects who actually settled themselves in New Canaan and built houses for themselves and their families and then for other clients. But that's not to say that the, the designs were always well received. And in fact, one critic declared the architecture to be as gracious as Sunoco service stations. <laughs> but the truth is that they've stood the test of time. And Johnson's signature glass house became a National Historic Landmark in 1997. And it's owned um, by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And tourists depart by group in a van from a visitor center in downtown New Canaan. And they're really very popular and you have to reserve in advance. And the first time we visited, I was just crushed because it was a rainy day. But the truth is, see that in the, the house was beautiful beautiful in the rain, and I'd like to go back and see it in the snow. Um, but anyway, it sits on this incredible, very bucolic 49-acre um, site, and Johnson had a real flair for the dramatic. The van enters through um, a big gateway, and then you go down this very, very long, twisting road, and all of a sudden the house just seems to materialize in the landscape. It's quite marvelous. So obviously the exterior walls are all glass and there are no interior walls. There's only this um, round enclosure that houses the mechanical systems and a bathroom. But Johnson always said that his house was just like his grandparents' house. It had a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and a bedroom. But the thing is, I doubt that his grandparents' house had these amazing views from every angle, and I'm also thinking that his grandparents probably did not spend as much time washing windows. <laughs> but anyway, um, Johnson and his partner, David Whitney, lived here, and um, they loved to invite guests for um, lunch every Sunday. And I'm sure that this was a highly coveted invitation, but guests had to be on their best behavior. Um, Johnson was known as a real neatnik, and guests could not even leave like a sweater or a purse on one of those Barcelona chairs. Um, it, it just he always wanted everything to just be beautiful and pristine. Sort of the other extreme, from simplicity to Victorian Gothic. Uh, this is the Mark Twain house outside of Hartford. Um, and looking at how gaudy it is, and we'll get to that in a minute, it's kind of hard to believe that Sam Clemens, also known as Mark Twain, grew up in the slave state of Missouri, worked as a union printer in New York and Philadelphia, and uh, before he headed west and reinvented himself as a journalist. Um, and that was a choice of occupation that changed his life. Because when he, he had an assignment to cover a trip to Europe aboard a steamship, Europe and the Holy Land, and on board he met Charles Langdon on board the ship, and Charlie showed him a picture of his sister, Olivia. Clemens was immediately smitten, and three years later, Sam Clemens and Olivia Langdon married. Through his wife, Clemens came to know what he called all manner of what he called socialists, principled atheists, and activists for women's rights and social equality. Uh, the house that Sam and Livy built is right next door to uh, the, the home of uh, Harry Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, and, but it was hardly as spare as such populist sympathies might suggest. Uh, it's a vision of what one wag called steamboat gothic. Uh, you know, oops, there's Sam himself, okay. Um, 
it's a gingerbread Victorian, near, nearly as broad as it is long. And uh, the finishes inside were done by a young Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who was just starting his career. And it was a trophy house for a really successful author. As Clemens himself quipped, I was born modest, but I soon got over it. <laughs> uh, the couple only lived here for a decade, um, from 1881 to 1891, but what a decade it was in American letters. This is the, uh, on the top floor, this is the billiards room. And over in the corner there is a desk where he wrote pretty much every day. In one decade, Twain managed to write The Gilded Age, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Prince and the Pauper, Life on the Mississippi, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, uh, A Tramp Abroad, and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Now that's an accomplishment. You can only see one door here. There's another one over to the right here. Um, and each of those doors led out to a covered porch. So when Sam Clemens needed to take a break from being Mark Twain, he would step outside and smoke a cigar. <laughs> Okay, so from this uh, steamboat gothic style, now we're moving on to Vermont and to a real steamboat. This is the um, Ticonderoga at the Shelburne Museum in Shelburne. And it's a little surprising to discover a 220 foot, 892, 892 ton um, steamship on the grassy lawn on the eastern banks of Lake Champlain. But in a way, actually, the ship has come back home. The Ticonderoga was built in um, Shelburne in 1909, and oh no, 1906, excuse me. And she began her service carrying vacationers, um, vacationing New Yorkers from Westport, um, New York, to St. Albans, Vermont. And then when other modes of transportation replaced um, steamships, she ended her years of service as a, a Lake Champlain excursion boat. In the 1950s, Electra Havemeyer Webb, the founder of Shelburne Museum, added the steamship to her collection of American art, um, folk art, and architecture. And it was honestly, it was no small feat to get this huge ship to the museum grounds, but Webb must have been just a very determined woman. Workmen had to dig a basin on the shoreline, um, pump it dry, add temporary rail lines, and then settle a railroad carriage in it. Then they filled it with water so the steamship could float in. And once it was in, they drained it again so that she could settle you know, on the supports. And after that, they dragged it to the museum. It was apparently considered a landmark in historic marine preservation. But the truth is the Ticonderoga is the last steamboat of her style that still exists in the United States. And it's a reminder of really, I think, a particularly glamorous era of travel. So um, once in place, she was restored to her glory years, which were basically around the 1920s. So visitors to the museum can board the ship, and you can marvel at the elaborate um, design of the public spaces, and then peek into the more modest staterooms. And you can also go behind the scenes to see the, um, the cruise quarters, more modest yet, um, the pilot house, um, the hand-built steam engine, and the coal-fired boilers. Now, Webb clearly was a stickler for details because once she had the steamboat, she also purchased the 1871 Colchester Reef Lighthouse to keep it company. So it's really, the campus is really a fun place to visit. They have this incredible circus memorabilia also. And moving downstate, this is the Calvin Coolidge Homestead in Plymouth. Now, Silent Cal, as the media of his day liked to call President John Calvin Coolidge Jr., was every bit the taciturn Yankee. He was the only president actually born on the 4th of July in 1872, uh, and he spent the first 11 years of his life either at this house or the one across the street uh, in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, before they packed him off to go study at St. Johnsbury Academy and then later at Amherst College. 
But even as he rose in the ranks of Massachusetts and even national politics, he kept coming back to Plymouth Notch regularly to stay with his father. Uh, he was elected as the Republican vice president in 1920, and he was at the homestead when President Warren G. Harding died suddenly in 1923. But the officials had to notify Coolidge by a messenger because the household had no telephone, no electricity, or for that matter, no running water. Um, Cal's father, a notary public, administered the oath of office to his son by lantern light at 2.43 a.m. on August 3rd, 1923. The Homestead Building, uh, which is this one, is rather quietly evocative. This is the room where the oath was administered. That's the kerosene lamp, and that's the family Bible. Uh, on which the 30th president of the United States swore his allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. Now across the street, the Calvin Coolidge birthplace is a more modest house, uh, it, but it's the only one in the homestead complex restored to its original state. And as good Yankees, the Coolidges never threw anything away, right? So when this when made into a National Historic Site, they donated all the original furnishings to bring the property back to 1872, uh, right down to the quilt on the narrow bed where Coolidge was born. The attached general store, however, is not, uh, which is, by the way, where John Coolidge was the storekeeper when Cal was born, isn't so much true to the, their era, but it's the real McCoy of general stores. It has rockers on the front porch, a pot-bellied stove inside, penny candy, and a now inactive post office that served uh, the town until 1976. But what Coolidge would have liked better, I think, is that the store is still a going concern. It's a business, and it's a testament to the president who liked to say that the chief business of the American people is business. <laughs> So we're moving on to Maine, and this is the Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village in New Gloucester, and I just love that tractor. Um, so anyway, Sabbath Day Lake is one of three Shaker villages, Shaker communities, um, that are in the book, but this is the only one in New England, in fact, it's the only one in the world that is still active. And um, when we started our research for our book, three members of the community um, remained. Now today, unfortunately, there are only two. Brother Arnold had, it is, is in his 60s, and the more elderly um, sister June Carpenter is also still there. And honestly, she's like a really good New England lady. I have never seen her age or date of birth published anywhere. Um, now at times they're joined by a, a novitiate. To, so that that person can see if he or she would like to join um, the Shaker community. They make a commitment to spend a year to see if it's for them. But I think you all know that the Shaker life is really not for everyone. Um, as you, and I'm sure as you know, um, Shaker men and women do not mix, although they are treated as equals and they practice celibacy. But um, nevertheless, Sabbath Day Lake quickly gained 179 converts when it was founded in the 1790s. But it was the smallest, the most remote, and the poorest of the Shaker communities in the eastern United States. But, you know, that said, it's the survivor. And, you know, if you don't really know about the history, you might just drive down the road and think it's another kind of struggling Maine agricultural um, village just trying to get by but you know it's really worth stopping it's a pretty interesting place and guided tours unfortunately are not given by either of those shakers by, but by a member of a group called the friends of shakers and they're an auxiliary organization that also helps with the farming chores the community still raises these wonderful sheep and Scotland, Scottish Highland cattle. They grow vegetables and herbs. Um, they sell seeds and they keep bees and chickens. Um, they also lease out their apple orchards and some of their farmland. Now, visitors can enter a few of the 17 buildings that are still left on the property. And it includes a dwelling for young boys and then a larger brick dwelling house where the men and women had separate but equal 
um, quarters. And you can also um, visit the sisters shop where they would do laundry, knit, sew, and assemble oval poplar boxes, which are really one of the most famous of the beautiful Shaker handcrafts. And the tour ends here. This is the 1794 meeting house. And as you can see, there are two separate doors and men would enter at one and women at the other. And then once inside, the community members would sing and dance to profess their faith. And as I'm sure you all know, that's how it's believed they got the name of the Shakers. Now there are still Sunday worship services here, but they're, in, um, they're really much more intimate. They're held in um, a chapel in the dwelling house, but visitors are very, very welcome. And I have to tell you, you will not see any dancing, but you will probably hear at least a few of the more than 10,000 Shaker songs. And after the service, visitors can join those two Shakers um, for coffee and donuts. And the thing about this is, this is just right up in Maine, and you will never have that experience anywhere else in the world. Now, it might be a gift to be simple, but uh, Ruggles Sylvester Morse didn't think so. Uh, we devote an, a lot of pages in this book to the Newport mansions <clears throat> and the sort of architectural arms race that created one of the more over-the-top neighborhoods in all of America. But excess knows no state boundaries. Maine native Ruggles Sylvester Morse knew all those uh, Vanderbilt and Astors from his days as a hotelier in New York. So when he set out to build a summer home in Maine for his homesick wife, he simply opened up his pocketbook and signed up one of the star New York Society architects, Henry Austin. Now this was in the 1850s, as you can see, it says 1858 right there. Uh, mo many of Morse's hotels were in New Orleans, and when war broke out, he, was, he stayed there, which is why his hotels came through the Civil War. Um, and meanwhile, back in Maine, his architect was busy spending his money. Uh, because he was told to create the most modern, opulent, and luxurious home in the country. He was supposed to have every amenity that Morse's guests enjoyed at his hotels. So Austin installed gas lights, central heating, flush toilets, hot and cold running water. It's in the 1850s, mind you. And every room had a servant call bell. But Morse didn't stop there. He hired Gustav Hurd to decorate it. Um, the furniture was all custom made. Front hall was carpeted wall to wall because that's what he had in his hotels. And instead of covering the walls with wallpaper, Herder hired an artist to paint, uh, who was famous for his opera scenery, by the way, hired him to paint frescoes and trompe l'oeil decorations on the walls. Everything else that could be gilded, as you can see, was all the better to reflect both the gas lights. Now, Victoria Mansion earns a special place in uh, interior decorating history. You know, it's sort of a subspecialty of uh, the decorative arts, I guess. Uh, because Herder went on to become a very famous <coughs> furniture designer. Uh, and this is the only Herder interior that remains intact. Um, to tour the house is to imagine what it's like, would, would have been like to live as a fabulously rich Victorian. And as if that wasn't ornate enough, the house after closing down for a while in the fall reopens at Christmas time, lit up like a Christmas tree. Okay, you've almost made it through here. We're on the last state, New Hampshire. And this is the USS Albacore in Portsmouth. And as you can see, I, I have this thing, I guess, for ships that are landlocked somewhere. Um, so anyway, I've got to tell you, if you want to test your tolerance for enclosed spaces, 
just tour, you know, a submarine. Um, and the albacore is actually one of three that are included in the book. So you would have a lot of, of different chances. And she sits in a, a concrete cradle here, um, not far from the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which was where she was launched in 1953. And she served the Navy for 19 years and even set an on, uh, unbroken, submerged um, speed record in 1966. But we can't tell you what it is because even now, more than 50 years later, the Navy still keeps it classified. Now, the Albacore was conceived as a test vessel to improve submarines after World War II, and she never carried a weapon. The teardrop shape of her hull was one of the major innovations in submarine designs, and it was adopted only after extensive <coughs> hydrodynamic and wind tunnel testing. And I love this historic photo of some of the testing of the shape. And that teardrop shape um, quickly became the standard for the U.S. Navy as well as those of England, France, and the Soviet Union. And the Albacore's design throughout her service, it was constantly um, tweaked and improved. And she tested everything from new control systems to um, dive brakes and escape mechanisms. When she was decommissioned in 1972, it took her until 1985 to find her way back to Portsmouth. Um, but what I really love about build, uh, visiting here and also visiting the historic vessels in um, Fall River that are included in the book is that um, sh shipbuilders and the men and women who served on ships, they just <coughs> never forget um, their vessels. And so um, you, you might very well find yourself touring with someone who served on one of the ships or, or even helped um, build them. And I've got to tell you, they usually have some great stories and they love to share them. Um, so this is a really kind of low-tech tour. You, kind of, you walk through on your own unless you find someone who knows the vessel and wants to tell you about it. But visitors are encouraged to think of themselves as if they were crew members. And kids really especially um, seem to love it. You can look up through the periscope, you can take the controls, and my favorite, try to slide into these really little narrow bunks that are stacked um, three and four high. Um, and as you walk through these really narrow hallways and duck your head under the very low doorways, you'll soon find out that for the Navy, a cutting edge vessel had nothing to do with luxury. In our final spot, <clears throat> this is the Robert Frost Farm in Derry, New Hampshire. <clears throat> and of all the National Historic Landmarks in the book, I feel closest to this one, and I'll tell you why. Seventy years, more, almost to the week, after young Rob Frost moved into the Magoon place on the south side of town to try to make a go of it as a chicken farmer, I went to work teaching English at Pinkerton Academy about two miles away. And as close as I could tell, there was no other way for a poet to make a living. And Frost kind of came to the same conclusion. Uh, ultimately, he sold the farm and went to work for Pinkerton as well. Uh, since even a school teacher's salary garnered him more money than his chickens and eggs could. Um, now, I kept waiting for Ezra Pound to discover me and get my first book published. But as it turned out, I was no Robert Frost. And neither was Frost when he first moved here. Uh, this is the landscape that haunts his works for decades and decades later. This is where Rob Frost, family man and chicken farmer, became Robert Frost, one of the singular voices of American literature. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, he famously wrote, and there behind the farmhouse, just at the edge of the apple orchard, just as he described it, is the old stone wall. Uh, its topmost stones are tumbled by the frost heaves, and it's easy to imagine, you know, young Rob Frost walking down the wall in the springtime with his neighbor, Napoleon Gee, mending the tumble down gaps. Good fences make good neighbors, Napoleon said. And uh, Frost was never clear if he agreed, but. The poet's oldest child, Leslie Frost Ballantyne, 
uh, directed the restoration of the farmhouse as a New Hampshire State Park and historic home. And her living memory, whoops, we'll get back to that in just a second. Conjured up some of the details. Um, they made it seem like the poet had just stepped out, you know, uh, including this peculiar Blickensdurfer typewriter on the kitchen table, which is what he wrote a lot of those early poems on. Um, also, the party line telephone that hung on the wall, where he would just sort of lift up and listen in a little bit so he could study the speech of his neighbors. <laughs> but the nicest thing and she remembered this and recounted it in quite some detail. From the upstairs window at night, Frost would teach astronomy to his children. And each child had a star that was his or her own. And he told them that for all their lives, wherever they might be, they were never alone. All they had to do was look up to the sky, night sky and they could find their family. So thank you very much. That's sort of concludes that portion of the program. I'll switch this on. So we can see, see your hands if you've got some questions for us. Hi. Can we, can we go back to uh, when you were originally at the beginning? We are talking about presidents who were born in Massachusetts. Right. Yeah. Uh, did you skip over the one that's still alive? <laughs> Good boy. Yes, but it's not his home. It's not a national historic landmark. Oh, but you're uh, okay. right. But you're right. You're right. Yes. He's the only one that wasn't named John, by the way. Yeah, you're right. But you know, we should make note of that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the other you, thing is, if I may say quickly, please. When he ran for the presidency against Michael Dukakis, they were both born in the same county. I think it's Lovelock County, yeah, sure. one was Brookline, one was um, Milton. Uh, yeah, Milton. Yeah, Milton. Yeah, Milton. Yeah, Milton. Yeah, Milton and Brookline. Yeah. So it was, it was just bizarre. That, at, I mean, back in the, in the yeah. beginning, they were all from the same area because it was a small country. Exactly. But by that time, the country was so large to find these two gentlemen running against each other for presidency, both from the same basic county. And, in Massachusetts was incredible. That's fast. That, uh, you're right. That's very cool. Thank you. We should okay. just mention one other thing. Uh, the Riverside, uh, the Riverside uh, carousel is absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely. And there was a guy down there. The first time I visited, there was a fellow down there. They have a bell in the middle. He could bring that bell to the tomb down by the Riverside. Oh, it took me a minute to catch what he was. You know, but my brother and I were down there, and he's going. I'm down, 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 down by the roof. I said, oh, that's cute. Of course. <laughs> it is just beautiful. It is gorgeous. It is I mean, it's just wonderful. Oh, to watch I wrote the thing know. myself. <laughs> so did we. I mean, it's only a couple of bucks. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's very reasonable. And it's true, there's a really good summer season. Really so food shack right next to it in the park. Mm -hmm. So you have a nice afternoon. Beautiful yeah. park across the street from it, leading down to the, yeah. yep. I guess, the bay. Well, across yeah. the park, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. So you have a nice afternoon there. And it wouldn't be that bad as a ride from here. And if you're really nutty and you, and you ride bicycles, you sat at Bristol, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You sat at Bristol, you stayed back, right right up there, and, yeah. and that's, that's how I found it. Yeah, I know. New England is full of great stuff. It really is. Some more, yes. The National Parks Pass gets back into the Most of these are free. Not all of them. Uh, actually, it, it, uh, it doesn't get you into any that are privately owned. Like some, it would like. Um, the Adams Homesteads. Or and, Augusta um, St. God, God, St. God, which is a national park. Anything so. that's a national park but or national Franklin park. Pierce's house? No. <laughs> yeah, so only the ones that are like no. actual national parks. Like yeah. Yeah. We don't say the exact admission because it changes every year, but it'll tell you whether admission is charged, um, tell you at least the season they're open and you know point you to a website. We decided that we didn't want to put information like a price and days of the week that would be something to change yeah. in, a, in a year that'd be out of date. But yeah, it, it gives you the needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Oh, now our, our pleasure. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? <clears throat> yeah. Victorian Mansion. Yes. You didn't mention where in Maine that was. It's in Portland. I'm sorry. Oh. I, I should have mentioned that. It's, it's in the header for all of our talks. Yeah. Right? I'm like carrying away talking about, <laughs> talking about how he didn't believe in it, yeah. that it was a gift to be simple. Yeah. And I forgot to mention it was important. But well, you could walk if you been walking distance of the Portland Museum. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Is Olmsted uh, uh, home Brookline in your book? It's not in the book. And it is a National Historic Landmark. It's not in the book. We didn't put it, I forget the reason. It had to do with, well, for one thing, it was closed for 10 years. Um, yeah, they renovated for quite some time. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. They give a lot of free tours during the year. They do now. They, yes. uh, well, even when they were, were uh, renovating, they renovation. still gave the yeah. tours. Yeah, they did. In fact, I think they even did more just to keep... Yeah, keep people interested. You go on their, uh, their website. Uh, it's a fascinating place. Yeah. yeah. But it isn't. I can't... Re if I couldn't even tell you in a way now how we made our decisions because it, yeah. was, it was agonizing. I mean, some of the places we have had to leave out are really quite wonderful. We're thinking we should do all of the One of their tours uh, goes through the history and you walk through the fens. Yeah. Yes. And you land up in Fenway Park and I tour know. the whole park. Yeah. All free. Um, it's wonderful, which also isn't a national historic landmark. Yes. Oh, no. okay. No. Yeah. Well, I think that the owners probably didn't want to because I don't think they could do the kind of right. renovations right. they're doing. It fell under that kind of status. More questions, anyone? Hi. Well, what's your next project? Question. This is wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, We've been mulling over a book on Ireland. Yeah, we've been um, about, yeah, I've just actually applied for, um, I'm the granddaughter of Irish immigrants, and I, I've just applied for my Irish um, citizenship. So um, just, I don't know, because it seemed a nice thing to do for my heritage. So we've been mulling over a book on Ireland, and we've been mulling over a book. We live in Cambridge, and we've been mulling over a short, funny book um, following on the 100 places to do in X city before you die or whatever, 100 things to do in Cambridge before you graduate. 100 so legal one, things to do. Which we can't respond. Someone will buy it for every student going to all the universities <laughs> in Cambridge. So we, yeah, I don't know. We're trying, we're trying to figure out our very project. We've well, also been thinking about a, a sort of following up this, but just doing more with artists and writers, but in a larger geographic area. We'll figure it out. You do know the St. God Angel is Irish. Yes. Yes. Irish and, and, Irish and French. The girl that he French. used yeah. as the model was also Irish. That I didn't but, know. The but Diana. at that time, no Irish need apply was still in effect. Yeah. And it was, I guess, a bit of a controversy. Uh, that we were putting an Irish person on our currency. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh for now look, they run the city of Boston. Yeah. 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 They did, yeah. Yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> 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 an Irish. He's an Irish. He's an Irish. Yes, he is. His, grand, his parents actually are Irish. His parents were Irish. Yeah. 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 yeah, so he's very close. My grandfather yeah. came from the north and he was a weaver. And um, I grew up in Manchester, Connecticut, and this is also not in the book, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, Cheney Mills in Manchester, Connecticut was the largest silk mill in the country, and they advertised for skilled weavers throughout Europe. So there are just sort of all these amazing little places tucked away all over New England. And the other thing that's fun about almost every one of these places, when you go there, you'll find some cute little place where you can have lunch. <laughs> Here's your next project. There you go. <laughs> Check out our website, hungrytravelers.com. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming.